So, welcome. Um, my name is Jeff Green, I'm a doctor. Um, I spent about 40 years around anthroposophy, either with the ideas and maybe 30 years as a GP using it in different forms. Um, I've done, this is actually threefoldness part two, or threefoldness plus, as I like to call it. You get a bit extra for your money for this one, because I throw a fourth body in just for extra, okay? So, um, I have done, there is out there, probably a million hits at the moment, uh, threefoldness part for part one. And in that, I really kind of tried to cut across lots of different disciplines to, to paint the picture of how big threefoldness actually is. So I, I talked about threefoldness in relation to anatomy, to mythology, to psychology, to physiology, and really tried to just paint how large it is. And it's, in a way, it's like three primary colours. Yeah? It's like this, this blueness, this redness, and this yellowness. And this is, a, I want to really emphasise this, they are qualities. It is not in any way judgmental. You cannot say, yellow is bad, red is good. Yeah? You can say, maybe that was a bit too much yellow, and maybe you should have put, used a bit of blue around the outside. But they are qualities. So anything I say here is not in any way to say this is better than that. It's not at all that sort of a conversation. It's just really characterising it. Because what I want to do now is take it further. So I started in that first talk. I'm slowly moving over here so the camera can follow me. And I took it into the animal types. And I really love this. So I use this a lot because... They're very close to us, so the psychology, you can almost get the flavour of what being an eagle would be like. You only have to watch one of the harrier hawks or one of the New Zealand falcons as it hangs around over Tamata Peak, and you can really begin to feel what the soul life is. So that's why I use them a lot. So in a way, it's become my sort of icon or my uh, mantra. Yeah, there's this eagle force. And what I'll emphasise about this is the aloneness of the eagle. How it lives in its isolated, crisp, eerie, all on its own, maybe with its mate, but just really a solitary character. And that when it comes to earth, it sort of brings death. Yeah, <coughs> its feet are not soft and paddy. They're all sharp and killy. Yeah, so they dig in. That was the eagle quality. And I talked about the lion quality, this pussycat quality in the middle. And what I wanted to emphasise again with that was that it is also in a way where we are social. You know, you get the whole pride. Not the herd, the pride. There's this very complicated and convoluted hierarchical structure that they live in. Very sophisticated, you know, like meerkats or whatever. It's very organised. So really, in a way, this is also the centre of the social life. But pussycats are terrible, terrible sleepers. 19 hours a day, your average pussycat will spend basking in the sun. And they live in this sort of dream-like existence. Whereas the eagle, you look at the eye of the eagle, lives in this super awake thing. And then I talk about the walrus, and I talked about the walrus and its qualities, its blubberiness. Um, you know, each of them has a, a tissue quality. Uh, this is the, unfortunately, the quality of the walrus, which I keep here. This blubbery, soft, warm, flobby stuff, rather than this muscular, nice, rippled, toned, and defined stuff that he has, or the scarily inflated, light, and insubstantial stuff that he has. So this blubbery walrus also has this quality of the many. Yeah, it has massiveness not only in itself, but massiveness in its number. <coughs> it is one of the herd. But also the other quality that you don't get from this picture is its power. More people are killed in Africa by hippos than they are by lions or vultures. 
It has actually an awesome powerfulness. So those are other qualities because where I'm going is a horrible, horrible place. Okay, and I have to start this with a disclaimer. This, what I'm about to do is evil, all right? Because I am going, people are looking shocked in the audience. What's he going to do? <laughs> Cut the head off a chicken and paint across. No, I'm not going to. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to characterise now people as if they are animals, okay? And that is evil because I'm going to deny their humanity. But where I'm going with this, because I want to take it now into clinical medicine, is you could start to see certain people as eagle-like. You could start to see certain people as leonine, as lion-like. And you could start to see certain people as walrus-like. But, and I learned this by lecturing about it, because people started to question me. What I've done is, is um, I've pictured people in terms of being stuck in one of these three polarities. So I'm just going to draw that. Uh, so if I draw this uh, threefold picture as a kind of traffic lights, and that in an ideal world, oops, that's wrong. We have all three of them. I need a blue. Um, that would be a kind of idealised picture of the perfect person. But you can start playing with that. You can start saying, well, what if you didn't have that and didn't have that? What if you were really heavily invested in that top pole? That you would start becoming one-sided. But for most of us, we are able to move between all three. When you start talking about human beings, you actually have to add a fourth principle into this. And that is what I like to call the angel line. And the human being, you can draw it like that, or you could draw it if you wanted to, in this sort of way. This ability to go up and down, this kind of mercurial quality, which is, of course, the caduceus, the sort of symbol of healing. This, it's almost something about health, is the ability to keep moving between these three different poles. And when you look at these ancient pictures, so I'm going over here now, these are sort of motifs over the cathedral uh, in Chartres, and you can see that Christ is pictured in the centre, and there are, in fact, three beings around him. And they are the eagle, the lion, and here the bull instead of the walrus. But there is this fourth character. Yeah? And it's here as well, this picture by Raphael. Here you have the beasts, but you also have this. So really, when you start talking about people, there is this fourth quality. The ability to move between the other three. Yeah, and that's in a way somehow something that never quite comes to earth, but it gives us that ability to be human while diving into different animalistic qualities. Okay? So it's a bit of a philosophical blurb. But now what I want to do is. Um, talk a little bit about these types. So you can already, with any kind of imagination, with those animal pictures, start to imagine what these types would be. You can think about the kind of job that this person would have. You can think about the kind of tissue that if you put your hands on them, what this person's neck would feel like as opposed to that person's neck. You can feel that the tissue here would tend to be somehow drier and harder, whereas this would tend to be warm and soft and blubbery. And this would tend to be more toned and defined. So you can already start making very generalised pictures about what these three different types would be like. And of course, my favourite walrus man of all time, Homer Simpson. Yeah, the archetypal walrus family, all in yellow, just to keep the colour coordination going, and w with the classic blubber that we talked about earlier. Yeah, so 
you've got, you know, it's great, the Simpsons, they've become this sort of, uh, yeah, uh, mantra for the working class humour. Yeah, this is a kind of all good, do sort of stuff. Drink stuff is a, is a walrus. So they're kind of times, but I don't want to just stay there. I want to actually take it into three case histories. I want to talk about three people. And I'm, um, I just think case histories are kind of, in a way, more uh, real. So I want to talk about three patients that would have been in a practice that I ran all at the same time. Uh, and I, of course, changed all of the details. Uh, and I like to call them Kai, Ron, and Mum. All right? And... They are a little bit composite. They're like over 30 years of practice. They're, in a way, things that I've gleaned from different people. But I will have a particular person in mind when I'm, when I'm describing it. So I just want to start talking about Let's start with Kai. Okay, Kai was um, a woman probably in her mid-30s. Um, she had actually had anorexia when she was young. She had trouble in her teens with anorexia. Obviously, she had come through it, but she was still painfully skinny. Uh, and her tissue had never really recovered. It was still quite dry. Um, she was very bony. Whenever I examined her, her neck was very tight. Um, and she came to me because at that stage, I did a lot of weirdo medicine. Yeah? And she was very much more driven by the fact that she did not want any of those horrible drugs. Yeah, she did low, you know, that I would ever prescribe an antibiotic or paracetamol. Yeah, so she was very, very, uh, wanted control all the time of anything she put in her body. But she had a lot of problems. It seemed like everything down this pole of her body didn't work. Her digestion didn't work properly. She got kind of irritable bowel thing. She had to be very careful with what she ate. Her periods were irregular, scant. Um, and she was always coming in with a new thing that was a problem. Uh, she discovered that, you know, if she ate this kind of uh, product, this kind of rice cracker, it would start giving her a lot of bloating. That if she, if she did uh, anything, she was exposed to this kind of chemical, and uh, she would, you know, get all kinds of weird reactions, pains and things like that. But she also... Um, brought a lot to the consult because she was very intelligent, very sensitive. If ever I used homeopathic or natural remedies on her, she always got a response, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but, but she was exquisitely sensitive to anything I used. Um, and also she was very interesting to talk to. She was really insightful. Um, she, she knew a lot, and, but looking back over it, she actually, although she, she knew a lot, it was always in a way about what was wrong with things. She was really good at clarifying what the problems with other things were. And behind it all was always a kind of um, a very high expectation of everyone and every institution around her. So that everything seemed to always fall short of what she wanted. And it was interesting, her relationship with me. Um, she came to me because I was interested in other ways. But in a way, she never quite trusted that I was quite as ideologically correct as I could be. She always, it was always like suspicion that maybe I would one day try and sneak an antibiotic in or, you know force her to get immunised or, you know, there was always a, there was a kind of, so in a way she almost like had a superior relationship to me because she felt, I think, that she was more ideologically pure than I was. So I was a little bit somehow sullied by the doctor, you know, sort of what I've gone through. I'd probably been a bit ideologically polluted. So, so she, her relationship with, with me was that she was somehow maybe superior. At times we were equals when we talked about things and she would accept my judgment on certain things, but she would never relinquish control. And what she wanted from me 
was in a way to help her keep away from the bad things. So the fact that I would use a homeopathic and uh, natural plant remedy rather than using uh, orthodox medicine was why she came to me. So that's Kai. Now, let's go to the other end. Mo. Mo was a lovely guy, big guy. He was about six foot three. And I don't know, maybe 120 kgs. And I had met Mo when I used to work out in the community, out in the outreach on a marae. And he had come to me, big guy, had a sort of grisly voice. And everything uh, I did, he said, awesome, Jeff, awesome, yeah. And he was, he was, he had, his legs were like tree stumps, yeah, massive, great look. He had a sh shaggy beard that never was quite well kept. And his voice was always this growly sort of big bear thing. And he came to me because he had everything wrong with him. He had gout, he had diabetes, he was hypertensive, yeah? These were the things. And he had what, you know, now would be described as metabolic disease. So he had all of those things of too much. Um, and in a way, he wouldn't come to me if he didn't have to because he, he loathed spending the money. But he realised he was ill. And really he saw me as his body mechanic. Yeah? My job was just to keep the body going. And he was only early 40s, but it was already, you know, a lot of things were wrong with him. Now, Mo's relationship to me was totally different. Mo thought I was awesome. Yeah? He, he just, anything I suggested, yeah, good one, Jeff, I'll do that. Yeah. Uh, he thought I was brilliant. He had a total trust in me. I could have told him, I think you need to, you know, inhale Dettol. And he yeah, all right, yeah, it's good. Yeah. But, um, so he had this amazing sort of almost awe of me. The fact that I was a doctor on its own gave me an, an, a, a totally un... I didn't need to prove myself. That was enough. I was already... A trustworthy person. The fact that he could talk to me was an added bonus. But what he wanted from me in the end was drugs. He wanted me to give him drugs because he wanted to get on with his life. And he was absolutely the salt of the earth guy. He, you know, when we talked, he would talk about, never talk about himself, he'd talk about his Mariah, he would talk about um, oh, his son, how he just thought his son could make the All Blacks one day, you know, he's got He's a big lad, but, you know, he's really shaping up. He's looking good, you know. And he was, he was just totally not about himself. And if he didn't have to take these drugs, he wouldn't take them. If it wasn't for the gout, he wouldn't have come in at all. So Mo was a lot more, uh, in a way, easy to deal with because I didn't have to go through all of this questioning and the fact that she'd just gone to Google and they'd told her something different and there was this website about immunisations she was going into and didn't she, I think that there was additives and, you know, it was, this was great. It was great. As long as I met him and I was warm, he had loads of goodwill. But everything I told Mo to do, he didn't do. Yeah? I would say, look, Mo, you know, you've really, you've got to lose some weight. I think you've got to start exercising. <coughs> You know, and you know, you're just you're eating the wrong sort of food and you can't keep drinking the the grog, you know, yeah, all right, you feel and I'd go out at lunch break, I'd be walking around and there'd be Mo with a pie, cigarette, oh, oh Jeff, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of good old, yeah. And it was like, you know, there was no sort of buying. He he wanted me to provide the drugs, but he didn't have that sort of I must control my life. Yeah, he was so happy with his life as it was. And sometimes when I pushed him a little bit hard, he, he said to me, Jeff, this is how my people live, you know? We just, this is how we eat the kai, we all come together. You know, he was, this was really not something he was going to change. This is the way he was. That's mine. <coughs> now, there was Ron. Ron was a lovely guy. I really enjoyed Ron. Ron, first time he ever turned up, he was a good-looking dude. He was probably in his mid-50s when I first saw him. But he still had the long hair. Yeah, and sometimes wear it in a ponytail. And he was a good Hawke's Bay lad. You know, he'd grown up in the Hawke's Bay. He had been a surfer. 
He was always tanned. He had, you know, really those surfer shoulders, big, muscular, still in his 50s. Hadn't put the weight on, yeah? And he had come up through Hawke's Bay in New Zealand when it was still, you know, a paradise, really. He had worked in the meat works. He'd earned loads of money. Big, strong guy throwing these meat carcasses around and had earned enough money to buy a house, get a yacht, keep the surfing going. And then his life went bad. He put his back out. He had a dalliance with the next door neighbor's wife. And everything fell apart. Yeah, the wife left him, his wife left him. And he got remarried, but now he was on an invalid's benefit. You know, he could never work because his back was always playing up. Although, interestingly, he was still able to surf and sail. But, but there you go. You know, he had radiological evidence of back damage. So he, he, was, um, he just came to see me, basically, to fill out the benefit form. Yeah, it was a very simple thing. And when I'd see him on my list, I'd think, oh, great, Ron's coming. Yeah. And to be honest, don't tell anyone in the DHB, but he'd come through and I'd fill out the form and it was all pretty much so. And then I'd put it aside and we'd talk. And it was great to talk to. He was funny, he didn't break boundaries, but we could talk about things. I could tell him things I wouldn't normally tell, patients, jokes and stuff. And it really became more like a friend. Yeah? Um, and my relationship with him maybe went a little bit too friendly, you know? One time I did him a favour, not, not anything, I mean, I just was spent a little bit extra time and sorted something out. When I went out and the receptionist the, oh, also liked it when Ron came, it was like 9 out of 10, they would also say, oh, he's left you a little envelope. So I'd open this envelope and two perfectly rolled joints were sitting inside. <laughs> <laughs> it's right, okay, that goes in the bin straight away. You know. But it turned out that Ron made a little bit of extra cash for himself by a little bit of a hydroponic operation going out in the shed and sold this. And when I realised it and talked to Ron, he was actually quietly stoned almost all the time and had been probably since he was 13. Yeah? Just a constant, regular pattern. And there was always this feeling with Ron that although he kind of had it all, he was sort of golden, he was good looking and he had the yacht and he had the surfboard and he paid the house that actually he lived in this sort of limbo world of, you know, the invalid's benefit and there was always this kind of sadness behind it that somehow he hadn't ever fulfilled his potential and that it was somehow comfortable but not really fulfilled and occasionally I would try to pick this up and try and get him go a bit further but he never really it's almost like he was addicted to this comfortable life he had built around himself and I'd occasionally I'd try and get him to do maybe some art therapy or I'd, I'd push him maybe he could start working again but in the end this attraction of the fact that he'd found a sort of world that he could live in, um, he couldn't leave that. So his relationship to me was friendly, but what he wanted me was to keep him comfortable. He wanted to keep in the comfort zone. Uh, and he didn't, in the end, want me to push him out of it. So those are three different brief characterisations. And what I've tried to do is, is say, look, you know, this is the good points, but there is also, in a way, there is a kind of tragedy behind them all. And just like in the animal pictures, they are gorgeous and magnificent, but each one is somehow sort of trapped in the mask of that animalness. No lion ever said, I'm not eating any more meat, I'm going to tofu from now on. Yeah? I'm giving up all this shagging all the girls in the pride. I'm just going to be celibate. You know, they, they are locked into their lines. No eagle said, I'm going to go down. I'm going to chat with all those walruses. Hey, see how they get on? No, no, it has to. They are locked. And that's, in a way, the tragedy of 
each of these characterizations, there is a certain locked inness. And that health is somehow in this angel line keeping alive. And if you take these three characterizations and in a way find a disease that sums them up, and this is the extreme that you can think about in a way this picture of anorexia has a very strong eagle-like picture. You know, you get these uh, particularly girls, but these, these young people just approaching puberty, you know? And there's a little bit of breast development, the periods are starting, and it's almost like they don't want to go there. This means this murky world. And the anorexia stops all the secondary sexual characteristics, the periods stop, and they pull back into a sort of pre-pubertal personality. And it's all about controlling what goes in their mouth. This is the key thing, the control. And then you've got, in a way, this picture, this people who, in a way, seem not to care about their own health. And the classic, it's not used a lot now, but we used to talk about the psychopath. And this is the extreme version of it. This is someone who actually, you know, gets drunk, drives fast cars, jumps off of buildings. It's almost like a recklessness with their health. But you could also put that into the, the kind of picture of, you know, the diabetic who just can't be bothered taking their tablets or can't be bothered using the insulin. There's a sort of reckless disregard for their own health. And then this kind of disease in the middle of the lion is this addiction. Now, I know there's lots of thing about, you know, what is addiction and whatever. But in a way, addiction gives you the ability not to be there. You know, there's this joke about if you were really in the 60s, you can't remember it. You know, because you were so stoned or on acid that you actually... So an addictive process sort of, in a way stops you being in the moment. The addiction takes over. And I know this with talking to dope guys. They, all they talk about in the end is the dope. They've lost any kind of interest in the world. They've lost any sort of interest in doing it. But the dope is actually the only thing they talk about. It fills the entire time, either getting it, paying for it, or smoking it. So... Those diseases characterise it. But you can also talk about drugs that engender it. Recreational drugs that engender it. Um, and although this is again a bit of a simplification, a bit of a, a um, yeah, a, 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 a taking only one thing, you can look at different chemicals, recreational drugs, that engender either the eagle, the lion, or the walrus. And a really good drug that helps eagleness are cigarettes. Uh, and I used to be a smoker. I used to uh, I come from a long line of smokers. They're very disappointed that I've given it up because it's what we do. And I used, to, I used to smoke through my uh, houseman years. And I, I kind of gave up because I didn't really get it. But there was, I do remember one particular cigarette. And it really, it, I got it. I was doing, I'd been working the whole weekend as a houseman. I had hardly slept. And it was like three in the morning on Sunday. And I just, I just needed to lay down and sleep just 10 minutes. And I just put my head down and the bleep went off again. You know, Dr. Green's new admission, you've got to come down. And I just went to pieces. I can't do this. I just can't do this. I, I'm, I'm going to have to ring up the registrar. I, 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 you know, and I just was in, in a sort of uh, doing the Homer Simpson. Uh, you know, I just co couldn't cope with it. And I got on the white coat and I'm walking across this English car park and the wind is howling through. And I had my tobacco in my white coat. 
and I used to roll my own cigarettes at that stage. And I quickly went behind a, a toilet or something like that, rolled myself a, the biggest, fattest cigarette I've ever rolled in my life, lit it, and <laughs> sucked that carcinogenic nicotine right down. Right, every last bit of it. And I was just amazed because it was like a blue cloak. And I got a bit colder, my warmth withdraw, my eyes sort of felt a little bit more bulgy, but it was almost like the inner voice just changed in a moment. And from this, I can't do it, I can't do it, it was like, come on, Jeff. Yeah, just clock this patient in, have another cup of coffee, the day shift will be on by eight, that's only four hours, of, you know. You'll struggle through Monday, you're off. And I did it. I went on and finished the shift. And this was eagle weed. Yeah, this was like, I'd lost my eagle. I'd lost that kind of, that cool, calm, abstract, distant world. And the tobacco gave it to me. It's amazing. Yeah. But it's also marijuana. Dope. Now, I know none of us here have ever smoked dope because, as we know, it's illegal, not eagle, yeah? Um, but apparently, talking to people, what happens is you can be in a group of people. You don't really know them, you know? You've only just met them. You've wandered into this party. And you know how you do So, uh, where are you from? Um, what do you do? Uh, you know, you do that making conversation thing. Actually, you don't feel... don't want to say anything so you're not going to you're going to sit there for an hour and not say something or you start talking to someone you tell them your deepest dreams yeah I really wanted to be a neurosurgeon actually you know yeah neurology that's really where it is now you know and you can this wonderful suddenly this whole lion thing is working for you really well you know all of that angst and that difficultness is gone and you become a sort of um you become part of a group instantly without any of the pain that normally goes with it. Lion weed, yeah. But then we have good old alcohol. And this is the drug of the walrus. Yeah, you've got all these jobs now where you're not allowed to express your anger. You are, um, you know, these poor people in these call centres. And we're all so internet savvy, you know. We're doing these things where you have to, you'd really like to send an email that says, please go to hell, but you don't. You write, you know, I feel that that perhaps is not the best. Yeah, and the phone goes, and yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, what, could, if you could stop shouting. And you'd really like to, but you don't, because you're not allowed to do that. So you, yes, I can, yeah, I, I, I hear that you're angry about this, yeah, yeah, really like to, but you don't. And by Friday night, you've had a whole week of pushing this down. So what you do is you go out and you drink two bottles of wine or 15 pints of tui, and before you know it, you're up on the floor. You're walrusing, yes? You're having a great... You're, and maybe you're even hitting a few people. And in the morning, you wake up and there's a person laying next to you, and uh, obviously there are other aspects of the walrus pole that you've explored in the evening, yeah? So what it does is release the inner walrus. It allows all that good metabolic juiciness to come out. So you've used these drugs to actually access or release these different soul forces. Now, I give this talk to teenagers. And I do it all with the whole fourfold picture of the threefold being that there is this angel line. And what I do, the reason I do it is because you cannot tell teenagers you're a very naughty person for smoking that cigarette. Yeah? Because that doesn't work with teenagers. But what I do is describe those three drugs and then I say, okay, you use it to get there, but what happens if you start becoming dependent on it is the only way of accessing that particular soul mode. You know, and that if you become 
sort of addicted to it, that what you become in the end, the face of the chronic smoker, and especially if it's gone to a sort of lung cancer, is that. Yeah? It's these bulging eyes, this wasted face, this sort of wired picture, that the face of the dope fiend, who just smokes dope all the time, is that. Yeah? Sleep in the garden, snoozing in the sunshine. Yeah? No, you know, talks about things, never does it, has lost the big picture, is just living in this world of a kind of familiarity. And the face of the chronic alcoholic, or the body, is that. Fat, overweight, asleep on the couch, drooling, yeah? And that what happens if you start to rely on a drug to access the soul thing is that you become tragically trapped in the animal picture. And what you've actually lost is the, ego, the um, angel life. You've actually, the tragedy of the alcoholic, chronic smoker, dope head, is that they've in a way lost their humanity as an ability to move between it and have in a way taken on the mask-like quality that the animal picture has. So that's enough picking on patients. Let's pick on doctors for a change, yeah? Because this is what I thought. I always looked at this in terms of, oh, patients are like this, patients are like that. And then I thought, well, hang on, patients are like that. Maybe doctors are like that as well. Why not? They're people too, you know? And I then I realised that I've actually been each of these doctors. I have been an eagle doctor in my very career. I have been a walrus doctor. And I've been a lion doctor too. Now, let me describe each of those three situations. One, when I was an eagle doctor, I used to work in this therapy centre uh, in an Australian city, which will remain nameless, but it's in Victoria. And I was there. It was very much into supplements. It was very much an alternative centre. It was very much people coming with allergies and also with... Um, toxin exposure and chronic fatigue. It was that kind of a centre. It was very much, it was also cancer patients as well, but it was very much people who maybe had been let down by modern medicine or didn't feel it had much to offer. And it was a quality of the work that I would work alongside people and I was still very young and very sort of unchallenging and very anti-drug myself. And I would accompany this person as they uh, withdrew from, the, they stopped that kind of food. We'd, we'd try diets, we'd, exclusion diets. We'd always start everyone on exclusion diets and they'd avoid certain foods and I'd put them on a basic diet and maybe we'd introduce and if it didn't work, we'd go back onto this very simple diet and remove other things. And often they would come with chemical intoxication. So we'd, we'd avoid this and I'd write them letters that the council couldn't spray stuff outside their door. And then we'd go, actually it was certain perfumes and so I'd, I'd make sure that they never had to go in places where they, you know, so I'd, I'd be really helping. And then it'd be only certain rice crackers, you know, and then they'd find that this particular brand also gave them bloating. And then it would one particular rice cracker, you know, and then it would be that actually it wasn't rice crackers, it was other people. I actually had patients sitting in my waiting room with brown paper bags over their heads because they didn't want to the visual intoxication of other people's bright colours. And then, you know, and then after doing this and, and trying to be a good doctor and help people, I realised I've merely assisted this person's total siege mentality and withdrawal from the world. And she says, I feel pretty good, but, but you have no life. You know, I, I haven't helped you at all. I just, I've, all I've done is assisted your pathology, you know. And that actually something to do with health is not just assisting someone in their pathology. I admit, when you start with people, you've got to start where they are 
and you do have to do the talky-talky stuff, but actually this kind of patient, if I look at it, needed to be slowly brought down into her feeling life. We needed to talk not just about the abstract things, but she maybe needed to be led slowly into an art therapy thing. And eventually, if really I was working, I'd finally get her into her body. She actually felt good about her body and allowed maybe to put on a little bit of weight or allowed to actually enjoy a sensual, bodily-based experience without having to analyse it or explain it. And that actually, I had not, although they were very happy with what I had done, I hadn't actually helped them. Not in terms of health. But I've also been a walrus doctor. Yeah, for 12 years I worked in a big medical centre. And honestly, it was a case of the masses. Yeah? You're always 12 patients behind. There was always more to be done. You know, there was always more DHB protocols about diabetes treatment. There was always more LDLs to be lowered and HDLs to be raised and more blood pressure. Yeah? So I have done that where I've worked like an absolute Trojan. I could see 10 an hour. You know, I could push them through in four minutes. And when you're working like that in these walrus practices, it works so much better if you've got a walrus patient. Yeah, someone who implicitly trusts you, never questions you, and heaven forbid ever brings any emotional things into the room. You know, as a young doctor, uh, if a patient cried in front of me, I used to feel incredibly honoured that they felt they could trust me. But when I'm working it as a walrus doctor, I'm like, oh no, this is just slow the whole, it's gonna take half an hour to get this person out of the room, you know? Just take a tissue and, you know, cry out. So you, you've got this kind of thing where, okay, they're walrus patients and you can treat them with walrus medicine. You can see 10 an hour, but basically all you're doing is dishing out the drugs. Yeah, it's all drug based. And really all you're doing is being a body mechanic. All you're doing is getting everything normal. Yeah, you're, you're, you're merely getting all the numbers sorted. Um, so I've also been a walrus doctor, but I've been a lion doctor as well. When I first set up the practice, I had a practice which was very much tied to a particular community, and everyone felt very comfortable with me as their doctor, and they would come to me, and I, was, I could talk the talk, and I knew the words, and there was a great sort of feeling of, you're our doctor, we're your patients. Yeah? And I remember one patient saying to me, I do actually have a real doctor, but I think of you as my boutique doctor. <laughs> I thought, right, I'm not sure that was a compliment. Um, but so I ran something, and it was very groovy, and I had kind of wooden toys, and I had the Madonnas, and, you know, and it was, there was a kind of feeling that there was, this was, we're all groovy here, and we're all talking the same talk, but I don't know if I'm actually pushing you in the directions you need to go, because it was all too comfortable. Now, I've described that in myself, but I've also seen that, you know, I'm not the only person. I saw a beautiful picture when I was training of a, a, a specialist. He was just magnificent. He was the real, it was Mitchell Higgs was his name. He had slightly longer hair, had a three-piece suit, had the tie with a matching uh, little handkerchief in, and it was just wonderful to watch. He would come up to his, the door, turn to his registrar, who would say, Annie Jones, Annie Jones, Annie, how are you? Oh, gorgeous, my favourite patient. Yeah, and the patient, oh, Dr. Higgs, you're so wonderful. Yeah, of course, he was a cardiologist, yeah? But they loved him, and he just romanced them all. So you can be that kind of a doctor, you know, just to have a group around you. But, and you can actually run a very good GP practice on 90% charm and a sort of Father Christmas personality and only 10% medicine. I shouldn't tell you that, but that's true. Yeah? So you can, you can do this thing where patients love you, and it is part of the, it is part of the art of medicine, but it, it is lion stuff. Yeah? And everyone's very comfortable with it, but sometimes you need to tell people things that they don't like. You actually need to get people to do things they don't want to do. 
And this is the problem within medicine as it becomes increasingly a sort of health consumers and doctors are getting, um, well, let's say, satisfaction uh, surveys on how the patients think that sometimes you don't want to have everyone happy, that sometimes health is getting out of the comfort zone. So you've got how doctors can be that, but you can also see that certain therapists could be like that as well. You know, if you have an eagle patient and they end up with a therapist who has a kind of, who's very alternative, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, but I mean it, the patient who is alternative, the, the, the therapist who is alternative because they are in reaction to orthodox medicine. Yeah, so they, if they see orthodox, anything orthodox as bad and only alternative is good, that will just make an eagle patient worse. And especially if you know, these patients can come on all kinds of weird exclusion diets, which can help, but you can get too much like that. And they can, if the uh, therapist is very much about uh, the world is a scary place and it's full of toxins, and also that there's a kind of tendency to sort of conspiracy theory, where of course the pharmacology departments never publish that stuff because, you know, vitamin C can cure cancer. It's not going to help if you're a, that kind of patient. Also, that you can have therapists who talk about, I'll put your back in for you. Yeah, that your body is just a machine. Or these passive treatments where they click things back in or they give you a tablet, you don't need to ask about it. Yeah, it's just, this will put you right and it's actually all taken out of the same jar. So this trustfulness of patients in the walrus group can work against them because they can be duped very easily, especially if they've also got things that medicine can't help. But there's also these kind of therapists who can... You know, these extremely charismatic therapists, and especially in small towns, everyone's going to the same person. Oh my God, he's marvellous. Now, he may be marvellous, but it, it could easily become a sort of lion therapist idea, where there's a kind of group think about how wonderful one person is. Behind these different types, in a way, each one has its strength, but it has also a weakness. You know, if you look at the eagle thing, that behind it, in a way, is a fearfulness. You know, a fear of the world, a fear of your feelings, a fear of your body. That the lion can have an addiction to comfort. That comfort is the only thing that matters. And with the walrus, you can have, in a way, an addiction to your body. Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at a kind of maxims within medicine that, that, that lean towards each one of this, in a way, you could say that for the eagle, prevention is better than cure. Yeah? And it's true. It is true. Prevention is better than cure. But if you keep... Um, you, if you, you can't... Can you really scare people well? If you make them fearful of everything, if you make them fearful of, of all things... And, you, and I often feel that as a doctor, I'm just trying to scare people well. And that's what these posters are about. Yeah, so these are all posters that I've taken down from medical centres where I've worked, you know. This is like, let's scare you well. You know, smoking is bad for you. That's true. Your, your uh, arteries will look like this. Be afraid of other people's sneezes, yeah. Be afraid of mening meningococcal. Now, this is what I'm saying about I am not judging. This is not saying it's wrong. But behind the eagle is an enormous amount of fear. 
And that's what this plays into. Um, behind the lion, you could almost like the definition of health would be health is the absence of disease. And often as a doctor, it's seen that my job is to take all your discomfort away. And more and more things are medicalised. So on in one hand, there's a sense that I need to take away the pain, the discomfort, that's fine. But what about erectile dysfunction in 80-year-olds? Yeah? What about menopausal angst of changes of life that I should, should I be giving them antidepressants? You know, there's all these things that, you know, what about the, the youth who's a bit well, sociophobic, or we used to call it shy? You know, should I put that person on Cipramil? Because there is some evidence that it helps. So there's more and more that health is the job of taking away a lack of ease, whereas that used to be part of life. And if fear, I'm trying to fear people well, wasn't it once true that from a spiritual perspective, we come to earth to get ill? In fact, even having a body is sort of a kind of illness. And I've actually talked to patients who've said to me, unbelievably, that tumour was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, you know, the illness can sometimes, from a sort of karmic life destiny, be actually meaningful, that it can be meaning engendering rather than something to be avoided. That actually avoiding pain, avoiding illness, this kind of living in siege mentality because you're frightened, Sometimes illness is the best thing that can ever happen to you. And sometimes it's only the painful times where you learn. It's only through suffering. You know the sad truth is that those times that were terrible are often the times that you grew the most and you learned the most. But the picture in here of the walrus is almost another picture of health. Health is normal that they are the same thing, you know, and that you've got this person coming to you. And I had, had this patient who I was seeing for, I don't know, cholesterol and blood pressure. And finally, I've got the blood pressure down below 120 over 80. Got the LDL down to 2.4, almost 2.3. HDL was almost up above one. And they committed suicide. You know, and so... Health is so much more than normal because you can have everything normal but live in a spiritual desolation. You know, there's got to be a picture of health that is more than bodily wellness. You know, it's got to have a component that is quality of life. And, you know, in a way, this idea that the, um, the non-examined life is not worth living also has to have, you can call it a spiritual component, but it's also, it's got to have an element of reflection. You've got to come to some sort of understanding of who you, what your life has been. Because um, if we talk about this thing, the therapeutic relationship, uh, and it does have to be a relationship, and you have a person let's say the eagle type, who is like this, locked into all this fearful wanting to avoid feelings and life, and they manage to seek out a therapist who is also like that, that is not a therapeutic relationship. That is therapeutic codependency. And all that you will do is in a way um, verify all of their inherent pathologies. And a therapeutic relationship, at least one of the members, and it doesn't have to be the doctor, has to have 
something going on in the other spheres. And there has to be some sort of a relationship that is helping this person, part of health has to be that they can move into the whole picture. Again, this caduceus picture. And, you know, moving, like with the eagle person, bringing them a little bit down into their feel feelings, finally into their bodily wellness. But very often, patients and doctors seek out people who confirm their own particular prejudices. And then you get not therapeutic relationships, but a codependency instead. <laughs>